Hello everyone, I'm George from Ireland. So behind me is the house where Richard Cobden lived and indeed died. So uh, Richard Cobden was a very well-known uh, politician of the mid-19th century. Uh, Cobden was born uh, in Sussex in 1804. Uh, that's, it's a little town of Midhurst, which is due south of London, and his family had lived there for centuries. And they've been fairly prominent at, at a county level, um, being met justices of the peace, um, owning mills and things like that. So his father was a tenant farmer, wasn't terribly good at it, um, and uh, kept having to move to smaller and smaller farms. But they managed to just about have middle class status. So Richard was one of several children, uh, and he went to uh, a dame school in Yorkshire, since it was run by a woman, thought not to be quite so good as a school run by a man. But the very fact they could send him to boarding school so far away showed they were of means. Remember, the early 19th century, a few children didn't get to school at all. Others only went to school just for a couple of years and there'd be a classroom full of 60 children scratching on slates and learning to read but not to write, so he was better educated than most people. But when he was an adolescent, he went out to work. He was given various positions in various companies run by in-laws and family friends. But then they noticed his insatiable uh, yearning for academic knowledge, but he was warned this is a very bad thing and this would distract him from commerce. Well, they were wrong. So he moved to Manchester. He eventually set up his own calico printing factory and became very prosperous was making over £10,000 a year at one stage. You could put two zeros on the end of that to get something close to the uh, modern day value of this. So Manchester was the coming city. It was growing rapidly, perhaps the foremost uh, industrial city of uh, the early 19th century and uh, a hotbed of uh, radicalism. Remember there had been the Peterloo massacre there in 1819 and he moved there shortly after that. Uh, so uh, he sympathised with the Whigs to begin with, but they weren't radical enough. Then he said, you know, he would be an outright radical. He was a disciple of Adam Smith because he read about political philosophy very broadly, admired Alexander Hamilton, some of the founding fathers of the United States. Um, so he said that there must be some sort of reform, but he didn't want to give the vote to the working class, didn't want to go that far. There was a limit to his radicalism, didn't want outright democracy. But uh, he was particularly appalled at the Corn Laws. After the Napoleonic Wars, these laws were brought in to uh, put an import tax on corn, so that um, in inflated the price of corn artificially. Of course, corn was, was turned into bread. That was what pe most people ate every day. So therefore, it was hitting the poorest hardest, and it was enriching the people who were already rich, uh, those who owned lots of farms. So many people, it was grossly unfair. The Tory party was entirely in favor of it. The Whig party was somewhat in favor of it. As I said, the Tories stood for the landed interest and the Whigs for the moneyed interest. Now that's, a, that's an oversimplification, and um, there were plenty landed Whigs as well, but probably a few more of them were the moneyed interest, as in factory and as bankers and so on. The Tories, of course, there were some manufacturers or bankers amongst the Tories, but not quite as many. So we mustn't exaggerate the distinction there. Um, anyway, so he was a leading light to the anti corn Law League, and Manchester being an industrial city, not a very agricultural area, they said it's unfair because we have, we, we factory workers have to spend more on this, or even the factory owners have to pay them more. So Cobden, he very much believed in laissez-faire, was completely against um, things such as like a minimum wage. So would be against what we'd now regard as, as uh, social justice, was uh, more or less a free market fundamentalist, though he was completely against slavery, which he regarded as morally repugnant. Um, although he was a Christian, Protestant indeed, he wasn't that much guided by his faith. Some people would, would specifically draw a direct line between Christianity and their political views. He wasn't one for that quite so much. Um, anyway, he also tried to enrich the cultural life of Manchester, helping to found the Athenaeum, writing many letters to the, to the newspapers, having them published, often under um, uh, Norm de Plume, and giving uh, public lectures on various topics. Uh, he was a very erudite man, well, completely autodidactic, and uh, an astonishing, spellbinding uh, public speaker. Um, so, uh, yeah, he was travelling all around the country, evangelising for the cause of free trade. So there should be no import taxes, no export taxes, no monopolies, really no restriction on what you buy, you buy or sell, or who you hire, and should have minimum regulations, more or less a minarchist. So he had a um, fairly consistent worldview. His political philosophy was that the government should stay out of people's lives in as much as possible, only intervene when absolutely necessary. Um, and uh, he wasn't against imperialism per se, but he felt the United Kingdom often fought uh, when it was unjustified, um, picked on feebler countries, 
such as Burma in particular, we'd now call it Myanmar, he noted how disputes with the United States were always resolved pacifically, but why could some amicable arrangement not be reached with Burma without coming to blows? That was because the United Kingdom was mighty. This is military technology was a couple of generations ahead of that of the Burmese, which is why it liked to pummel them into submission. So he said that uh, the United Kingdom was terribly bellicose and this bloodthirstiness uh, sickened him with shame. Um, he was completely against the opium wars, although he was not opposed to the sale of opium, because, of course, according to him, you should be able to buy and sell whatever you want to whomever you want. If it was unhealthy or addictive, well, he didn't care. That's an individual choice. It'd be wrong of the government to intervene uh, with uh, free commerce. Uh, so he was a free market fundamentalist, as I say. He did, he did regard slavery as utterly evil, because although slavery was outlawed here in 1833, phased out, well, outlawed in the UK from the 1780s, but outlawed in the colonies from 1833 onwards, phased out over four years. Uh, there were some people in the UK who'd been opposed to that even then, or said, okay, we don't have it in the British Empire, but people have it in the United States, that's entirely acceptable, we mustn't complain. But, but Cobden said, no, 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 slavery is um, a moral outrage. So he felt it was repugnant. And it, when it came to the American Civil War, his sympathies were entirely on the side of the Union, though he believed the United Kingdom should not intervene. I mean, having said that, I think very few people here think, believe that the UK should intervene. So he wanted the government to reduce spending as much as possible, to slash the armed forces, and um, or to always seek um, uh, a peaceable solution to international uh, disputes. Um, I thought they could be resolved more peacefully. So he's very widely travelled around Spain and France, into Italy. He travelled the Ottoman Empire and Turkey. He went to Egypt, which was part of the Ottoman Empire. He met the Khedive, Muhammad Ali, though he did not, uh, did not form such a favourable view of him as he anticipated because he was told that he was an annoyed and despot. He felt that really wasn't true. So, um, uh, yeah, he was, a, uh, he was a radical Whig, eventually becoming a liberal. The Liberal Party was founded not long before his death and embraced most of the liberal views, but was, was fairly advanced in those. Um, but uh, he um, thought that the Ottoman Empire was on its last legs and the United Kingdom was wrong to be propping it up. The Tory policy was quite um, uh, philo-Turkic, if it is that the word, um, pro the Ottoman Empire, just to try and keep the Russians out of the Mediterranean, or the, the, the believing the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire being the Caliph or Khalifa, successor of the Prophet Muhammad, would tell Mohammedans in the British Empire to be pro-British, and in return the UK would prop up the Ottomans, um, because remember the majority of subjects of the empire were Muslims. And he said, well, this is nonsense, we shouldn't be supporting such a, an, an immoral and oppressive regime. Um, it, it's, it's like not better than, than Russia's uh, uh, absolute monarchy. Um, so what's the next thing about uh, um, Cobden? Yeah, he had himself elected to Parliament. He was an ally of John Bright. He um, disliked the Chartists, though. He felt the Chartists went too far in calling for manhood suffrage, annual parliaments, payment of members of Parliament. That would be unnecessary expenditure. Keep spending down as much as possible. Um, and so he was a fascinating figure, famous for his, uh, his speeches, his newspaper articles, um, not, not longer writings, really. And he was known by just about everyone. So he, he travelled to Algeria. He was increasingly frail towards the end of his life and, owing to his infirmity, had to spend some of the winter months abroad. Um, and he um, helped sign the, the, the treaty with Chevalier, one of the French government ministers, about free trade. Um, knit together the two countries in amity. Um, uh, he thought that that that's, was the best thing to do and tax as little as possible, let wealth fructify in the pockets of the people, um, as he said. Um, so some people were against that, felt that free trade was bad news, felt that Napoleon III was bad news, and he said, no, we mustn't have this zero-sum game attitude that one country has to, has to lose or what other one can win. We can all gain by free trade, it'll enrich everybody. So his, his ideas had a lasting effect, this laissez-faire sort of liberalism lasted into the early 20th century, often known as Manchester a liberalism or even Cobdenism. There was even a Cobden Institute named in his honour. There's several towns around the world named Cobden after him. He scarcely ever talked about these days. So he died in 1865 and he's buried not too far away. So he married, he had children, but that was the end of Richard Cobden, who was, um, was sort of the, the, one of the household gods of mid Victorian uh, uh, liberalism. The, the Liberal Party as such wasn't founded till, till um, about four years before he died. Well, that is just a very little bit, a bit, little bit about Richard Cobden. You can see where he lived, you know, here on Suffolk Street, um, a very uh, wealthy uh, area of London, right in the heart of London, just around the corner from Trafalgar Square, gives you some uh, indication of just how affluent, affluent he was. So please follow me on, on Twitter, and Instagram, on Facebook. I teach online, I teach in person, sometimes history, politics, religious studies, um, French, law. I help him with dissertations, essays, um, and uh, theses, and I translate from French, Spanish, Italian, Romanian, German, and Russian. Okay, toodaloo.